Hello, and welcome back. So last time we got our web server actually running and accepting requests. And today we are going to work on actually doing things with what the client requests. Currently the server will only respond with a single message, homo deus, no matter what the user is actually asking for. So today we are going to actually do something more specific depending on what the user wants. And in order to get into this, we need to talk about HTTP request and response headers and the format of those requests and responses in those requests and responses in general. So I have the server running in this window and over in this window, I have written a Python script that is going to make a bunch of requests to the server. So I'm going to run that. And this is basically going to give us a way to see various types of requests from a client. So we can see here that that's a little too far. This is your basic get request. And we have just a bunch of different things written on different lines. And they're mostly all the same. What we can see here, this is a post request. And we can see sometimes the post request will have a message body along with it. And what we want to do is parse out this string that the client is sending us in order to get meaningful information out of it and do meaningful things with it. So let's first take a look at what the format of these requests and responses are. This is an article from Tutorials Point, and I will put a link to it in the description so you can reference it yourself. But basically what it tells us is that there is first a request line, then there are zero or more headers, then there's an empty line and a message body. So our request line is going to have several parts to it as well. We can see it right here. So this is our request line. It has the method that we are using, in this case, get. And then it has the URL that it's accessing as a subdomain of our domain. So in my case, my domain is homodeus.us. And so this slash just means it is the base domain, homodeus.us. If I wanted homodeus.us slash users or admin or whatever other URLs I had as part of that, this would be slash users or slash admin or whatever that was going to be. And then there is the HTTP version. And generally speaking, this is going to be 1.1. And so we have these three parts here that we'll need to access in order to collect information on them. And the first one I want to talk about is this, get. So this refers to the various kinds of protocols that you can do over HTTP. So that is going to be get, post, headers, options, uh, maybe put, I don't remember exactly all of them, but if we look up RESTful API, this is sort of the new standard when it comes to these protocols, and you'll see that there's a lo lot of overlap between them. So what we can see is that when HTTP is used, as is most common, the operations available are get, head, post, put, patch, delete, connect, options, and trace. And not all of these are the same in RESTful API, but these are the methods that we want to have access to and you're going to do different things for these different methods. So if they are sending a get request, that is going to be that they want something from me. They want me to send them a web page or a file or something like that. Post means that they are going to have some data that they want to send me as well. Patch and put, you don't use those as often, but they will do things a little bit differently. They, they just tell me kind of ahead of the game what is going to happen. Delete is an easy one to understand. I'm going to delete something from my server. Uh, odds are that if you are telling me to delete something, I'm not going to want to do that. <laughs> so the main ones we are worried about are get and post. But as always, I am trying to program these things so that they are future proof. I want to go ahead and implement all of these methods so that I don't have to do much updating later. If I have an application in the future that wants to make use of the patch or put methods, I want to just be able to continue using the things I've already made. So that is the first part of our request line. 
Then we're going to have this URL, which in the case of a web server, is going to tell us which HTML file to send the user for displaying. And then the version, we don't actually need to do a whole lot with. So unless something strange comes up there, not a whole lot to do there, but I'm still going to parse that out of this request string. That way I have it later if I ever need it. Okay, so the next thing are going to be these, what are they called again? I'm forgetting the name of it. They are the header fields. Okay, so these header fields are basically little variables and you can ignore them, but you can also do some interesting things with them. For one thing, this user agent, I can say that, oh, Python is the one that was making this request. Or I can see that the user is using Firefox or Safari or whatever they're using, Internet Explorer if they're a masochist. So we can see some information about that. The accept encoding, this tells us what sort of things they're willing to accept from us. And connection keep alive, this is something that we will talk more about in the future. But th these are all individual variables. And what I will want to do is essentially parse them out so that I can access them later and see what variables specifically this user has been requesting. And then the last part is going to be this. And this is not going to be present in every single HTTP request, but it will be there for some of them and it will be important. And this is, hooray, <laughs> this is the content body. And this is the thing that they are sending me. So when I make a response to this, I will have a header that's quite similar to the one they sent me, and then I'm going to have a body. And in my case, this body is going to take the form of my HTML. But for the user, they might want to send me some variables. So say they're trying to log in. They are going to want to send their username and password to the server. And this is how those are going to show up. So one would be the user or the variable name, and two would be the value associated with that variable. This and sign separates them, and then we have three equals four, so a variable three would equal four. And these are all going to be text at the moment. So I may need to do some things in the future to sort out actual numbers or different kinds of data that I might get here. But for now, all we are worried about is parsing out this request and getting this thing into a usable form. And unfortunately, it is well, we are using C, <laughs> so working with strings in C is not the easiest thing to do. So this is going to take several videos for me to put together. I'm going to have to do these things one at a time, but for now we are going to just create some basic objects in order to hold this information. So in my networking folder, I'm going to create a file and I'm going to call it HTTP request. And what I want to do is essentially create an object and a struct. And this struct is going to hold the different parts of this request. So this is going to have the request line, the headers, header fields, and then the body. But I need to be a little more specific than that. I need the method that they're using. I need the URL that they're using. I need the HTTP version. And then I need a dynamic set of header fields. So if we think about this, not every client is going to send me a content length. This one sends a content length of 16 because there are 16 characters in the body. This one has no body. So, oh, it's content length is zero. But let's see, this one up here does not have a content length at all. It does have connection keep alive. This, I think they all have connection keep alive. But you can see they don't all have the same header fields. So I can't say ahead of time that line one is going to be user agent and I'm to do this with that. So I'm going to have to dynamically create these and I smell a linked list in our future. So I'm glad we already have that ready to go. So let's work on actually parsing this out and let's focus on this first line. So what I need first is this method. So let's create an enumeration for all of the different method types. That way I can reference them by name. So I'm going to say enumeration, and I don't want type def. 
and this is a strange format. I don't like that. We're going to call this HTTP methods. And here we are just going to define all of the methods that we saw in our lovely Wikipedia article. Get, head, post, put, patch, delete, connect, options, and trace. I'm going to have to refer back to that because I am not going to remember that <laughs> off the top of my head. So get, post, put, head, patch, delete. Connect, options, and trace. And these are all of the methods that we can use. And if I'm not mistaken, RESTful API uses a subset of those. So let me see if I can find that quickly enough. I cannot find it quickly enough. Just know that RESTful API is sort of the standard for sending data between clients and servers and clients and clients in a peer-to-peer -peer network you could say so i am including all of the headers that are available for http and if i am remembering this correctly it is a subset of those that restful api can use i think it is git post put and head maybe i don't remember which ones they are doesn't matter anyway so we are going to just define those in an enumeration. That way the user can reference them by name. And also you'll notice that I'm using all caps for these. Typically in my enumerations, I would say like get, not in all caps, but just the format of these requests. You'll see here in the terminal that my requests have it in all caps and that is the standard. So I'm going to keep the standard. So then we're going to need an object to reference the request. So we'll say struct HTTP request. And the first thing that we're going to put in there is the enumeration value for method. So method. And then we're going to have a character array that is going to be the URL that they send us. And this is actually referred to as URI. I don't actually know what the I stands for, but that is what it is in this case. So we're going to have URI as a character array. And since I don't know the length of this character array, I'm going to use a pointer. So we're going to call it URI, not UTI. Uh, is that right? Yes, okay. And then we are going to have the HTTP version. And I could use a float for this because the version is always going to be numeric. And so I can predict that I will be sent HTTP slash and then some number. So let's use a float here. So we'll say HTTP version. And that needs to be a float. Next is the headers. So the header fields. And I am not quite sure how I'm going to do this yet. I think I'm thinking that a binary search tree will be appropriate. So if we think about this, I have key value pairs. So I have the key in this case is user agent and the value is Python requests 2.25.1. And what I am typically going to want to do is access the value based on the key. So I want this to be something that's more searchable than a linked list. Because if you remember in our linked list, we had to start at the beginning and move all the way through the end. Also, our node only holds one thing of data. And so I could hold the entire string user agent python request 2.25.1, but that doesn't lend itself well to actual usage. So I am probably going to want to store this as a key value pair. And what I'm thinking is that I can have a new type of node for a binary search tree that is sorted by the key, and then we access the value. I can store both of those in the node. And that's what I'm thinking. I need to do a little more planning before I actually implement that. So I think we're going to leave that alone for now. And the same thing is going to apply to the body. You see here again, we have key value pairs, one equals two three equals four. And again, we are going to want to use the key to reference the value. And 
a binary search tree is probably going to be useful there as well. Ultimately, I am thinking that I'm going to need a JSON library, and I will probably make that using a binary search tree. So <laughs> if you're not picking up on it, binary search tree is in our immediate future. But for now, let's just focus on this very first line, and I'm going to do nothing more in this request struct for the moment. Just know that in the future, we're going to come back to it and add those other parts. So let's create a, do we want a constructor for this? Yeah, we probably want a constructor for it because what's going to happen if we look at our server, what happens, or even better, our test, in the while loop here, the buffer gets filled with the request. And then we're going to pass that off to what I'm going to call the handler. And that is what is going to do something with the request. And what I'm probably going to end up doing is before sending this to the handler, I'm going to create an instance of my HTTP request object, filling in all of these pieces of information. That way I can pass that on to the handler and the handler can access them quite easily. So let's go ahead and create a constructor for this. So we're going to call it, what is this going to be? Struct HTTP request, and we'll call it HTTP request constructor. And we're going to need to pass this the string that is referring to what the user sent. So we're going to call this character pointer because they're going to send me an array of an unknown size. And we're going to call this request string. So using that request string, we're going to extract out the desired information. So let's clear some space here and open our C file. And let's define this constructor. So struct And here I'm going to need some header files. So I'm going to need string.h, and that is the standard library of string functions in C. So let's include that. And again, I am including that in the .c file rather than the .h file, because when someone imports my .h file or includes my .h file, they're not necessarily going to need to use the string.h header in their program. And I don't want to force them to import libraries that they aren't actually going to be using. So I include it in the .c file. That way, if they want this library in their file, they have to explicitly include it. Okay. So what we are going to use is a function called string token. And what this is going to do is chop up our request string and it is going to turn it into little pieces based on a delimiter. And that is a particular character that we can use to reference sections of a string. So if I, for example, have a string that says one, two, three, you can see that my comma is a delimiter. And what I can do is use this string token function to cut out my one and then cut out two and then cut out three. And it would be nice if it was as simple as that, but unfortunately it is not. Because what I need is this first line, I'm going to need that. Then I need all of these subsequent lines as a chunk, because these are all of the header fields. Then I need to recognize that there is a double space, and then this is the content body. So we have three sections here. We have the status line, we have the headers, and then we have the body. The status line is separated from the headers with one new line character. We can imagine there being a backslash n right here, and then backslash n's all across here. So if I use my backslash n as a delimiter, it will get me my first line correctly, but then I have no idea how many subsequent lines I'm going to need. So what I want to do is, in fact, convert this second backslash n here in the body to a different character that I can more easily chop out as my escape character or delimiter. 
but first we can extract the status line and we can do that with string token. So I'm going to define a character pointer called, is that what they were calling it over here? I wanna stick with what they said, request line, not status line. If I'm not mistaken, status line refers to the server's response. Yes, we can see a status line. So our status line is going to equal string token. And then here we're going to pass in request string. And then we want to put our delimiter, delimiter in. And I'm going to chop it on the backslash n. So everything before the first backslash n, it is going to return to me. So if we look here, it is going to return this whole first line. Then I can take this first line and parse it out even further. It's separated by spaces here, we can see. So I can use my string token again. But this is a destructive function. So before I do that, I actually want to go in and go through this entire string, find a instance of backslash n backslash n, and insert a new character here so that I can separate my body from my headers. It's easy to separate this request line, but the rest of it's going to be more difficult. So let's add a loop in here. So I'm going to say for int i equals zero. i is going to be less than, what am I doing here? Size of, no, not size of, string length of request string minus two. Okay. Why minus two? So remember that the array is zero based. So if I go all the way to the end of the string, then, or if I set the index of the length of the string, that is going to be out of bounds. That is going to be outside of the string. So we need to have it minus one. And in fact, I don't need to have it minus one. I only need to do that if I have less than or equal to, because I is less than the string length will be minus one but I still need a minus one here. And the reason for that is that I am looking for two characters next to each other, backslash n, backslash n. So I'm going to have to continually check the character I'm on and the character that comes after it. You can also do it backwards, the character I am on and the one before it, but that's a little trickier. So it's not, but <laughs> we're, we're not gonna do it that way. So what I want to do is check each subsequent character as well. And if we look at the very last character and we try to compare it with the character that comes after the very last character, again, we will be out of bounds. So that's why we put our minus one. So now we're gonna say I plus plus. And here I am going to search my request string for backslash n backslash n. So if request string I, the position we are on, equals backslash n and request string I plus one equals backslash n. I want to say request string I plus one equals, and I'm going to use this little vertical line as my statement. Okay, so a few things I want to point out here. First of all, if you're going to try and compare two strings, so let's say I have my name over here, Eric, and I have another string over here, and I want to see if this string is the same as this string, I cannot say if string one equals equals string two. Okay, you cannot compare character arrays in that way. You need to use a function called string compare or strcmp. And this is going to return one, zero, or negative one, if I remember correctly. But I am looking for an individual character. And what I can do is actually iterate through this string, because, because remember, a string is just an array of individual characters. And I can say, does the character in this position of the array equal this character? So that's why I can use equals equals here, but not if I'm comparing the whole string. Also notice that this backslash n has two characters in it, but I am treating it as if it is a single character. 
And the idea here is that this is what is called an escape character. And it is a double character that represents a single character. This is for a new line. And for example, let's say I have backslash zero. That th those two characters together, backslash and zero, represent the end of a string. That is the null character or the terminal character. Backslash n represents a new line. How are you going to represent a new line in quotes like this? You really can't. So that's why we have this escape character. Okay? So we have our escape character and we see if we have backslash n next to backslash n. If we do, we're going to replace the second one with a vertical line. And the output of this should be exactly the same as here. If I'm copying this, let's put it down here. What this will do is iterate through the entire string one at a time. It'll say that's a backslash n, but that is not. So it'll keep going. And again, it'll say the same thing. We'll get all the way down until we reach this position here. Okay, right here there is a backslash n, and the very next character is also a backslash n. We can demonstrate this by putting that there and that there. And what it will do is replace this backslash n with our vertical line. Okay, so now I can use my string token, and I can extract this, so I'll cut that one out. And then I'll use another string token to extract all of this. I'll cut that out. And then I know that the remainder is the body. So that's how we're going to separate our three sections. So we've replaced that character. And now we're going to say character, ooh, what were these, header, header fields equals string token. And we are going to pass this null. Okay, so when you pass a string into string token, it is going to remember the string that you sent it. And if I re pass in request string again, it will think that request string is empty. And so instead, I need to pass it null to say continue using the string that we were already using. Now we want to split it on the vertical line. Okay, and then finally, we are going to have our last one called body equals string token. And what do I want to put here? We're going to again say null. And then our separator, we can use the exact same one because this is just going to get the rest of it as our body. So those are our three sections. Why is that? I don't know what TID null is, but okay. Okay. And now we are going to create an instance of our HTTP request struct, and we're going to put these fields in there. The first one is this request line. So we're going to have git post and whatever the method is, then we will have the URI and then the HTTP version. So let's separate our request line into three sections again. If we take another look at it, we have the method a space, the URI, a space, and then the HTTP version. So let me think. We are going to say request line. No, we're not. We're going to create a new HTTP request struct. We're going to call it request. And let's say request.method. And we need to set it equal to well, we want to set it equal to the first part of the request line, again, separated with a token on a space character. But actually, we want to convert that into a integer that is one of our enumeration points. So let's do a little magic here. So let's say character pointer called method equals string token again. This time we're going to pass it our request line. And what we are going to look for is a space. So our method is now that. And we can use an if statement to select which method we want. And this is a bit tedious. So if now I have to use string compare because I'm trying to compare the 
the full string get to the test string get. So we are going to say method does that equal get. And then we're going to say request.method equals get. Else if strcmp method if that equals post request method equals post and I forgot something here so when you do the string compare we need to actually make sure that it equals zero because that says that the strings are the same and now I need to do this for all of the other types of request methods so let's say else if string compare method I should do this in a more efficient way so let's delete this one of the fun things about programming is that you can copy and paste what you've already written and that makes it a lot easier it's prone to errors but <laughs> it's easier put and we'll call this put then we have head head patch delete is that next yeah connect options and trace okay now I don't like this and the reason I don't like this is that I am trying to construct my HTTP request object here and as part of it I have to go through this whole thing that's basically a switch statement I can't use a switch statement because these have to be integral values, not string compare functions, but not, not the point. I have to do this whole thing in this constructor. So what I would rather do is define an additional function. This is going to return an int, and we're going to say method select. We're going to pass this a character array called, what are we going to call it? Method. Is that how we want to do it? Yes, that is how we want to do it. Okay, and now I can just copy and paste all of this into here, and I'm instead going to return get. And let us do a quick find and replace, and I'm going to look for, not in all caps, And I'm going to replace all of them with return. And let's get rid of that equals. So let's just haphazardly <laughs> do it to all of them. That should have worked. Okay, I think that did. <laughs> Is there a mistake here? No? Okay. So now we can just say that our method... Ooh, not, I don't want to delete that. I want to say request.method like that capital M equals method select passing it the string method now let's put those together and I want to move this just for some cleanliness I think the first thing that I should do is define the object that I'm going to return and I'll return it down here so we create an instance of our request object, then we start worrying about parsing out the string. First, we are going to separate out all of those sections. That is going to be the request line, the header fields, and the body. Of course, first we are going to insert this escape character that we can use. Then we'll separate those sections, and then we will work with the sections a little bit more. And for our, okay, now we need the URI. 
Okay, so we are going to do exactly the same thing. So char URI equals string token, and we'll pass it null because we already have request line in there. And again, we're going to separate it on a space. And we'll say request dot URI equals URI. And then we can, we don't need to do anything with the URI just yet. Eventually this will have more complicated routes on it, but at this point we're just trying to get that string just to separate it out from the rest of this line. And the last one is going to be kind of tricky because I need to parse out this string and remove this HTTP and slash. But that should be pretty easy if I'm not fooling myself. Yeah, yeah, it is. It is going to be easy. I'll show you what I'll do. Next is going to be character array called, what is it going to be called? HTTP version. And we're going to set that equal to string token. And again, we'll pass it null. And we're going to search for a space. No, we're not going to search for a space. Are we going to search for a space? Yeah, because that will give us this. And then we can call it again, separating it by the slash. Then we can call it again to get that final version. So what I'll do is say version equals string token, passing it null again, not TID null. No, not TID null, just null. And we're going to now separate it on a slash. And one more time. Okay. So what happens here is first we get our method. So we separate it on a slash on, on a space. Okay, that gives us this first thing, the post. Then we parse that out and do what we need to do there. Then we call string token again, again separating it, separating it on a space. So that is going to give us this slash. Finally, we call it one more time here, and we are going to get this HTTP 1.1 as our result. But by passing it null, and is that going to work? I don't know. Okay. 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 Now our HTTP version variable here is this, this HTTP slash 1.1. And what I'm going to do is call string token on that variable. So on this, I want to separate it by the slash. So this is going to return just the HTTP. And I know that it's HTTP. This is an HTTP request. So I can just discard this, call string token one more time on null, separating it on a slash, and that's going to give me 1.1. And this I will convert into a float and store in my actual request structure. Can I convert a character array to a float? Let's Google it together. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. Stack Overflow, tell us the answer. ATOF. Seems like that will work. Okay. Yes. Okay. So we will, after we have extracted that, we can say request dot version equals casting as a float. What was the name of that function again? S-T-R-O-F? No. A-T-O-F. A-2-F. I don't know what A stands for, but F is float, and this is A is being cast to a float. So we are going to pass this HTTP version, and this should store a float value inside there. But no, it doesn't like that standard lib dot h yeah let's fix that and let's include standard lib
Good to go. We should be good to go. Okay. And I think that is where I'm going to leave it for today. This is already becoming a somewhat long video. And we've done a lot. So we have created this enumeration for all of the different HTTP methods. This will be useful in a lot of different applications. Then we have began creating this struct that will hold a parsed version of our request string. We have then come down into this request string and begun parsing it into a version of this request struct. And next time we will work on probably working with these header fields and the body, or I might just keep what I have so far and try out sending different web pages using the request that I am receiving. We will see. I will have to do some experiments, see what I can get working. But for now, I think we are definitely on the right track. We are going to be able to do anything that any other web server can do with this. So I hope this was informative for you. I hope you learned something and enjoyed the video. If you did, please leave a like on the video. You can subscribe to the channel. If you are particularly enthusiastic, you can ring the little bell to get notifications. And otherwise, I am appreciative of your viewership. And I will see you next time. Toodaloo.